Um, I am super excited to introduce Brian T. O'Neill. He is the founder and principal of Designing for Analytics, which is an independent consultancy that helps technology leaders turn their data into valuable data products. Oh, this has been this has been his work for 25 years. He's worked with companies including Dell EMC, TripAdvisor, Fidelity, NetApp, and the list goes on and on, and uh, several SaaS startups as well. He also speaks internationally. He's given talks at O'Reilly Strata, Enterprise Data World, the International Institute for Analytics Symposium. We are so grateful to have him here. Uh, and also, he advises students at MIT's Sandbox Innovation Fund. So he's also been published by O'Reilly Media. So we, mm -hmm. we, we have a rock star on our stage. So uh, thank you so much for joining, <laughs> Brian. And I'm going to let you, I'm going to mute and let you take it away from here. Yeah, I have to say that O'Reilly comment. So it's not my book, but that there's a 97 things about UX book that I'm sure a lot of people here know, but there's also a 97 things about ethics and data science book. And they asked me to write something that and I'm not an ethicist, you know, but I focus obviously the human centered design background. And so I wrote a satire as my submission. And I wasn't sure if they were going to take it seriously. And it's like, I think it's like the second or third essay in the book. It's just a total satire about how you could you could use software to do all your ethics. So now you don't have to worry about anything. So, <laughs> so I thought it was pretty awesome that they were willing to publish the satire along with all the, the smart ethicists and, and PhD data scientists that were in there. So <laughs> anyhow, um, it's nice to be with all of you today. I wanna to talk about dancing with data science uh, a little bit. Uh, this, this talk is a little bit more focused at UX leadership. And I want to make that clear that for me, leadership and management aren't the same thing. So management is something that someone gives to you and leadership is something that everybody can do here. Um, this talk is really going to be focused on enterprise uh, software and what I specifically call enterprise data products here. Um, a little bit less so on consumer products here. Um, even more specifically, we're going to be talking a lot about um, decision support tools. So a lot of what data is being used for, particularly in the enterprise, is for theoretically for better decision making. Um, so there, you know, AI is a very broad term that includes robotic process automation and, and robotics. And now we have all the chatbots and large language models and stuff like that. So it's a really broad space. Um, and I'm I'm more specifically focused and specialized in the decision support area. Um, what we are not going to be talking about today is using AI to do design work or quantitative research. Um, sometimes when we hear AI and design, uh, I think sometimes we jump to, oh, it's how to use AI for design. And I know you've had some um, talks uh, about that. I'm going to be talking about the design of products that are using AI and particularly, uh, again, data products here. So I've got about eight nuggets of wisdom. I call it wisdom because this is subject to change. These are these are my opinions uh, from over the years of doing this. Uh, some of it's just based on fact and observation, but it's always subject to changing. And, I, and I'm always learning here and assuming the slides will be out of date at some point, especially with the pace of, of AI. Uh, and design being involved with machine learning teams or analytics teams, which is really kind of the sort of the predecessor to that, we're going to talk about that a little bit here, is, is very new and it's very infrequent. There's not a lot of that happening, particularly in the enterprise space. Um, so this is still a very new, uh, a new area here. Um, so just quickly about me, you kind of heard that in the bio, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. My formal background is actually in music. I do have another career as a professional percussionist and drummer. Uh, I've been doing design work since I was uh, in college. Um, and I was an employee, like probably many of you are, uh, in a full-time capacity at a, a bunch of different companies. And, and then I went solo in 2006. And I've been uh, consulting uh, ever since. And, and these days, I do very much specific in helping data product leaders increase adoption of machine learning and analytic, uh, analytic, analytic solutions using design. Uh, and why do I help them increase user adoption? The reason is that it, what you may find out if you are working in an enterprise data, um, anything related to building analytics or decision support applications and things like this, low adoption and trust for the people that we're trying to serve is one of the biggest problems these teams have. They go out and they build this stuff and it doesn't get used. And it's not much different than kind of where software world was, say, you know, 10, 20 years ago when everything was engineering first, design last. This is kind of where things are with the data product space uh, here. And it's a to me, it's a ripe opportunity for designers to actually get involved where 
the businesses are really focused and 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 I know a lot of designers are still are you know concerned about having that seat at the table and being heard and I can't get my work done you know I can't get people to let me do my work and it's like well the more you can align your work with where the puck is going and we're going to talk about in a second that's a that's a chance for you to kind of leapfrog into a very I'm going to call it a hot space but it is a hot space right now and align and, and showing how design can help these teams I think is a way to really accelerate the value of your work and, and surface that um, so I do have a, a podcast on this as well called Experiencing Data. Um, a lot of my guests tend to be from the product and, and data science worlds. Occasionally, we have some UX and uh, design people in there as well. Um, so if you're curious kind of about this whole data product space, uh, feel free to check that out. So let's jump into these eight things. The number one here is, is, again, this idea of skating where the puck is going. And this puck for many organizations right now, almost every you know C-level executive team has some kind of data strategy or AI strategy, which for many of them means we need AI. <laughs> and they send that down and, and the team start building stuff because they don't know what they wanna solve with it. They just know everyone else has it and there's FOMO. And so I think, we as designers are very good at, especially researchers, we know that there's a lot that goes into surfacing the actual problems and needs and not jumping to tactics. And so I think this is a right place where designers could really be helping like, okay, well, what does that mean? What are we trying to do? With that? What are our objectives? What are, what are the humans in the loop going to do that either aligns or doesn't align with that, the business objective we have for using uh, data? But the, the, the thinking still for a lot of these organizations is that especially enterprises that have been around for say, you know, traditional enterprise that might be around for 25, 30, 100, 200 years, they have all this data, which they thought was exhaust that came out of the back end of their computer systems and got stored somewhere. And now it's like, oh, it's gold, it's oil. It's, it's this refinable substance that we're supposed to productize and do stuff with it. And now we can do AI with it. What can we do with it? And it's very much a tactic uh, forward kind of thinking about it. Uh, and so what happens is we end up spending a ton of money and, and this is starting to change, but like money was being thrown at data science a few years ago, as you probably knew, that was one of the hottest jobs and everybody wanted to be a data scientist. And if you touch machine learning in any way, you're making a ton of money. But what was happening is that the, you know, we have these scientists and very skilled technologists basically, and, you know, in a room somewhere building models, mostly focused on building the highest accuracy models possible without any context of use. How will this be used in the last mile where humans get involved? And a lot of money got spent and a lot of experimentation was done, but there wasn't a lot of value created for anybody where the business value is a result of the humans in the loop actually using the applications that embody the AI that was being made to create some kind of value, to, to save money, to create new value, to uh, reduce work, to have more empowered decision-making. It's It wasn't happening. And so I think think this tide is kind of changing and, and these teams, especially the data science teams are realizing that there's a whole other, there's a, a whole other skill set, real skills, non-technical skills that are required here um, in order to actually deploy these things to get people to trust them and actually use them such that they have a chance of creating some kind of uh, actual value. So I think this is a place to stick your neck out. If you want, if you're looking for a chance to 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 lead in your organization and to put design on the map, it's like maybe you you set up a meeting and you say, hey, are, you know, you guys having challenges with low adoption of, of your machine learning work or any of your AI solutions or getting it into our digital products or helping the sales team or whatever teams you're trying to serve. And uh, I should mention too that a lot of these enterprise data teams are actually serving internal business customers. So if you ever worked on the internet, for example, that's an example of, you know, you're building tools for your colleagues and things like that. In large scale enterprises, many of them have analytics and data science teams, which are in charge of figuring out, oh, what can we do with all this data? And what can we do with machine learning? And so the heads of these departments are trying to fit often spending their time trying to figure out, well, what is the business problem you have for which maybe we can build a data product that goes with that, but they are not trained in that kind of stuff. They're, they're still more used to the tell us exactly what you want that involves data and we'll throw you back a dashboard or a report that has that information on it. And if the business orders up a, a machine learning model, a, you know, a, a, a GAN or whatever it is, it's like, do you want fries with that? 
And a lot of them send it back with the fries. And then what happens is it doesn't get used. I think that's a right place for designers and researchers to stick their neck in there and say, this is a place we can help. How can we help you do this? And so if you're looking for a place to an, an opportunity there, I think it's worth sticking again, have that conversation, see if you can get some, some time carved out of your you know, normal duties. And, and I think there's opportunity there. Um, the second one here is, um, <clears throat> and we're going to talk, I'm going to show you an example of this. This is a framework I have called CED, which stands for Conclusions, Evidence, Data, in that order. Um, and, and so it's, I, I should mention it that for the teams that are making these solutions, many of them have analytics backgrounds. So traditional analytics, when you think of like historical charts and, and numeric quantitative data and stuff, that's actually, if you think about that as a continuum or, a, or technical maturity, the, the, the basic stuff is historical real view, looking at data from the past on, on charts and trying to make decisions with your eyeballs, right? Eyeball, what I call eyeball analysis. Um, the far other end of that spectrum are tools that are literally telling you exactly what to do. We crunch the numbers. Here's the recommendation. You should you know, set your sales targets at this and your thresholds here. And here are the top 200 customers that are going to churn. And you should call them and offer this particular offer to get them to, to not churn. That's your prescriptive analytics or machine learning and AI type solutions here. But for designers uh, and, and even for non-designers, and I really made this framework primarily thinking about non-designers, but a lot of designers have, have adopted it. It's really thinking about when we build traditional solutions uh, with data, especially for decision support, AI is not always necessary. And, I, and, and we're going to talk more about that too in a second. Sometimes traditional analytics, particularly in decision-making, can do the job in a much faster uh, uh, um, time to market, uh, so, to, so to speak. We can get these kinds of things out much faster here. Uh, and so the idea here is that we want to try to surface conclusions in the information first before we shovel evidence at them. And evidence to me tends to be what I see on most designer created dashboards where there's just tons of charts. And to me, it's like, here's the proof. And it's like the proof of what? What are we, what did what are you telling me here? You're giving me all this evidence, but I don't know what the conclusion is. And that's where the rub is for a lot of uh, users and why we have. Uh, lack of use sometimes is they don't know what all the information means. And so this it's, it's a model. You can actually go to my site, designingforanalytics.com slash CED, if you're interested in learning more about this. The data part has to do with surfacing. Where did all the data come from that went into the evidence that went into the conclusions? And this is kind of from an experiential standpoint that the goal of this framework is to get people really thinking about the conclusion first. It could be a prediction from AI, it might not be, but the, the point is there's some conclusion or opinion generated from the data before we present the backing evidence that supports that conclusion, and definitely before we give access to like export the CSV or look at all the data sources and all the kind of the, 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 the plumbing that sometimes gets surfaced to users, like here's a 600 column Excel table because someone asked for a report on something and they, they you know, the, the, these data teams sometimes think that a business user is actually going to realistically do something with a table that has, you know, not, maybe not 600, but 60 columns of information in it. Humans can't process tabular data that way, but because they were asked for it, that's sometimes what's presented to them. So um, anyhow, the, the real important thing is conclusions first, followed by evidence and, and, and then data here. Um, Number three here, um, AI systems have more personas to design for. And, and again, this is a place where I think designers can particularly help remind organizations that they need to be thinking wider than just um, uh, either customer or stakeholder. Sometimes those are the same thing here, but I tend to think of it as there's a business stakeholder, someone that's funding a project, there's the actual customer or user of the solution, the technology that's going to be presented. Then we have like, affected third parties, right? So this is your, your downstream people that may not be in the room at all when it's made, but they're going to be affected by it. So simple example of that might be like, think of a security facial recognition software at the airport. We're all those affected third parties walking around with systems tracking our faces and all this kind of stuff, but we're not there. A lot of data teams are not going to be thinking about the passengers at the airport because they're not part of the quote solution. They're they're not a, a persona to design for. They weren't in the requirements. 
they're just kind of a they're just floating out there. And I think our human centered design perspectives can help remind these teams that they are they are part of the the way we conceive of this solution here. And that thinking about them can have a direct impact on whether or not the solution is, is considered ethical and like like. Would you feel good about this solution being in the front page of the New York Times if you found out what what kind of data you're actually trying to pull from people at the airport? We can help remind teams about how to design uh, for these um, these kind of third parties. Um, additional third parties here can be things like um, data labelers and raters. So when we build AI systems, there has to be a data set that's of high quality to train the model before we can have an application that uses this predictive model in it. So data is really important. And sometimes that data has to be manually labeled by people, which means we might need to build tools for them. And we might need to think about what is that experience like of the data labelers because they can introduce bias or or errors into the system or whatever it may be. So they, they can be a third party. Um, another one would be something like an auditor. So thinking about um, when things go wrong, like for or here, a great, ex a simple example would be like um, getting loan approval, right? You've probably all heard about how AI can be used to do this. And it tells the loan officer, should I give John Smith this loan for a mortgage for his house or not? Well, at some point, this AI might generate a, a recommendation. The answer is yes, and it's a 78% risk. And here are all the features that went into the model that here's the reasons why the model thinks we're 78% sure that it's okay to, to give this mortgage to this person. Down the road, if there was ever a problem here, you might need to go back and audit that system to understand, well, how did the model come up with that? And so thinking about that experience as well, and, and what would we do in that situation? Who are the parties involved with that? Again, these things tend to not get thought of as much because they're not directly about build the model, deploy the model, use it. There, there's a bigger ecosystem here. And I think designers are, we, we're used to thinking about all the humans because that's our focus all the time here. So um, again, uh, the, the 97 uh, things about ethics and data science, everyone should know that's a great uh, text if you're kind of interested in this, this space of trust and ethics and what a lot of AI researchers and data scientists are thinking about uh, in this space here. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, number four, um, this is an acronym I came up with called PICA. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about that. And this is about um, imagining places to use uh, machine learning uh, in your, your products here. Um, I tend to find again we've kind of talked about this but technical the technical people working in these these solutions are often not really trained to be problem finders they're more solution builders here and so coming up with those use cases as we talked about where you know the business says we need ai what's our what's our large language model strategy right now um it's like oh, we need a large language model. And they're trying to think about where's the data going to come from for the language model. They're not even thinking about who's going to use it. Why are they going to use it? What's the value? They're immediately starting to think about the data sets here. So I came up with this acronym to try to help uh, teams. Uh, and, and this is something I think that could be done with data science, uh, engineering people, product people, UX people can work on this uh, kind of stuff together uh, here. And, and, and part of this acronym is also to not use AI, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, but what does it stand for? So um, this stands for uh, predict, classify, augment, and automate. Uh, and so these are verbs that I think can help us think about when we, if you're, you know, if you're working on a software product, for example, where, where in the experience, especially if you're a researcher and you map that out, are there times where users have to make guesses about stuff that maybe they wouldn't have to, or are there times where they're trying to classify uh, things together in order to make decisions? Or is there places where uh, the tools, the um, uh, data could be used to augment the work that they're doing or even fully automate the work? Where where could we remove and put educated guesses or predictions uh, into the application? And the idea here is just to give a set of verbs here that can be used for brainstorming, uh, particularly if you know the software and the applications or the, the customers or users that you're around all the time, if you're familiar with their workflows and, and what it's like to be them, because you've done that ethno ethnography, this is a way to think about where could we find opportunities uh, uh, to do this kind of, um, to use this kind of technology in a way where it's actually going to create uh, some value here. Um, on the augment and automate thing, 
in most enterprise contexts, most AI right now is still very much focused on augmenting people's work. I don't think we're going to see a lot of bestseller books that are written by chat GPT. We might see books that were heavily influenced by that, not necessarily copying verbatim text, but authors, you know, particularly say nonfiction authors or whatever, can use these tools to uh, generate ideas and then counter uh, counter arguments to the ideas to dig holes in their thinking and then come up with like, oh, I never thought about that counter argument. I need to address that in my book about sales, whatever, because someone has a really valid argument and I've never actually written about that before. So these tools are often augmenting the work, just like they, I think they are for designers now and, and researchers. We, we're, we've all been probably using, uh, I'm really focusing on the LLM, the, the chat GPT stuff right now, because that's the stuff that we can see is, and it's, it's embodied in an application. I mean, we're using this stuff all the time and a lot of it's invisible, like Google Maps, for example. There's all kinds of stuff, machine learning that's happening under the covers and you don't see it because it doesn't feel like you're directly uh, interacting with it. but the augment space is really the place we want to be focused on here. And part of this is because with automation, the, the risks can, can go up. Um, so if you think about, you remember the 737 MAX aircraft, uh, the MCAS system on that is, is a classic example where they had, you know, the, the engineers had put into the, the airplane a system that the pilots didn't understand how it operated. And it was there for the benefit of the pilots, but when it it kicked, the automation kicked in, it caused the the this uh, a real risk to flying the aircraft here. And it was fully automated that they didn't know how to interact with it. They didn't know how to shut it off. There weren't guide rails in place there. Um, so automation actually has a, a a a lot of risks that can come in with it. And I think designers are 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 good because we can we can think about all the counter arguments to these things we can think about things like abusability testing or red team testing um we're used to again these human factors that come into play here the technical teams are so focused on the implementation of getting the models to actually work and and have predictive power often to relentlessly focus on the accuracy of the prediction above all else we need i think designers can be that that counter counterbalance to that technical work that is very important and needs to happen. Um, but but we need that human factors piece there as well. So uh, just a question for the I here. There's an I in the acronym. I don't know if anybody wants to take a guess uh, what the I stands for in the acronym. I'll watch the chat for a second, see if anyone knows. I think we've got integration from Trey. It's a verb. Okay, there's an inform, intelligence, individual. That's a noun. <laughs> Good shot though, Sarah. It stands for, wait for it, ignore. Why? Because I want you to remember that AI is not always the solution to these problems. We should not be trying to, and this is actually a verb at Google, to ML it. Let's ML it. This is a verb that I learned. I, I interviewed... Uh, Dai Deng, I think, who worked on the uh, people in AI research toolkit that Google has, and, and she floats around to a lot of the engineering teams. And, and because AI is such a big part of, uh, of how Google builds solutions, there tends to be this, this trend to even use this as a verb. And sometimes it's not appropriate to, to use that. And I want to give an example uh, of this about how we can still build useful decision support systems that don't necessarily use uh, machine learning and AI. Um, and we can develop so solutions faster. And, and, and again, a lot of this stuff is supposed to be hidden from users anyways. They're not always going to know it the way we think, you know, ChatGPT is such a different beast. And it's, and I know a lot of people are talking about that right now, but a lot of times this stuff should be invisible to users. So this is a quick story about uh, just an interface a pr a product that I worked on several years ago um, about the pink slip servers. So just for background here, imagine you are someone that's in charge of running a data center. So you have servers and storage and network and hardware down there, as well as all the software that's running on the system. And I tend to think of this as like, these are the people that just keep the lights on. And, and we just assume if you work in a big company, that email just works, that Slack just works, that there's oxygen in the air. You don't notice it until it's not working. But there are people whose job it is to keep all this infrastructure running. 
And one of the big challenges in that space, if you run infrastructure, is, is not dealing with when things break and go offline, but dealing with slowness. Slow application performance is very difficult to troubleshoot because there's so many places uh, within the, the uh, the IO path between, you know, your storage and server and your compute all the way back to the browser that the person is using or, or the software that they're using at the other end, stuff goes through so many wires and plumbing, it's, it's, there's a million places things can go wrong. So this, that, that's all the background you really need. I worked at a comp this company, this uh, consulting called Acori, and they built a tool called Balance Point. And the whole point of Balance Point was to help you troubleshoot uh, slow performance and to root cause it and immediately try to address it so that you can get systems back online as quickly as possible. Because when really important systems are hanging, like say the, you know, the accounting system, all the accountants are trying to get end of year reports in or tax time. And I imagine the system is just crawling and they can't do any other data entry there. That is costing businesses a ton of money. And when I came in there, they had this giant lists of these uh, of just table grids of data, tons and tons of, of columnar data. Um, and they were expecting that this is what uh, a, a server or storage admin would come in and look at this stuff every day and decide what to do. And in this case, this is a rather small environment. There's there were 13, what is it, 1300 virtual machines, that's what VM stands for, uh, running in this data center here. And they were supposed to come and look at all this kind of stuff and make a decision about, is this a big problem and what do I do about it? Uh, and unfortunately, these designs, as well as this one, and they even had a topology, if you think about a network diagram here that would show all of the storage, all the network, all the servers, everything on this giant network topology with thousands and thousands of nodes. I mean, you could just spend all day zooming and zooming out and you'd see these red lines everywhere. And it didn't tell you anything about how to deal with your problem. It looked cool for the sales team, but it didn't uh, didn't help you here. Um, and so what we we did we, we went out and talked to users right we came in and we we had uh we had some research and we we had tried to figure out well how do these people solve performance problems today when things go wrong and so i'm just going to walk you through this quickly this solution doesn't use uh ai it, it could have used that and you can see here when it's telling you the statuses and all this kind of stuff it looks like it's predicting some of these kinds of things but it's it's actually not here and it's much it was much faster to get a solution like this out at the time that wasn't using that uh, and what we found out here is that um, by walking through someone's uh, workflow we were able to figure out a design that was much better for them so what we did is we we had a dashboard and this is one of these widgets that was on there but it told you immediately how many VMs are in trouble right now? or we're recently in trouble. And, and there's this metric called PI or performance index. Just think of that as like a score of zero to a hundred. A hundred is really bad. That means you're using all your resources and things are slow. And 75 is kind of the golden place you want to be. Anything below that means everything's running fast. And we found out like the first thing that these people did is like, well, I go and look at it. And then I want to look at the, the, the performance over a period. Well, how long? Well, you know, I could it could be over a weekend. So I usually want to look at a few days. It's like, but well, why don't we just put a chart, like a 72 hour, three day chart there? So you don't have to go and drill down and look at all that, look at all that data and try to eyeball process this information. And th by the way, this workflow gets very lengthy. And so we've tried to con consolidate that here. And the next thing, and so that's what the number one in black there, that marker, that's what I'm I'm talking about here. So in this case, if you look at like web trade one, we can see that this thing has been running up at uh, a very high performance utilization since when, since roughly Wednesday, Thursday-ish, and it's it's still going on. And the second thing that they said they did is they looked over time, they wanted to know, well, how frequently does this happen? Like, does this web trade one VM, does this thing always get really hot uh, over Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at this time? Like maybe it's a backup job, maybe there's some processing that happens there. So the, next, so the next thing they wanted to do is they wanted to look at cycles there. And so they would go and eyeball the chart. And as you can see here, this thing normally is just flatline. And all of a sudden there's this little blip. And this, I'm looking at the, the number two uh, uh, there right now. And the little blip there represents this last 72 hour period. So now they know, okay, this is not normal. This, this machine, at least over the last six weeks, this is not a normally high activity period for the system. So now the next question in the workflow is, well, why is it like that? What happened that it's spiking right now such that I know who to call or what to do about it? 
And so we were able to dig the statistics out of the, uh, the APIs from VMware and, and display. In this case, the CP if you look over to the right now in number uh, annotation three, it says the CPU is waiting at 85% and the memory is uh, swapping right now. And at this point, we had enough information for this admin to pick up the phone and, and call his, in this case, he would call his probably server administrator because it's a CPU memory problem and not a storage problem. And they could go in and troubleshoot that. And he can give them all the information over the phone or send this to them an email or, or whatever it may be. Um, but the point here was that the, the, to the users here, they didn't care whether or not this used AI or not. In fact, the pink slip servers here, these people had a sense of like, there's, there's, 1300 virtual machines and applications I have to administer in my enterprise data center here, five of them get me fired. If they're in this list, I get fired. And humanizing this for the business to help them realize the stress level on these people, they did not ever want to see one of those pink slip servers. And just if there's anyone not from the US, pink slip was this like, just this concept of when you used to get fired, you'd get this, I think a carbon copy thing and you get a pink slip and that was like your last day of employment. And that was just a reference that one of these users used and I thought was really interesting there. But the point was these people want to get their work done. This person actually never wants to be in this tool. And if they're in here, they want to get out of this tool as fast as possible and get these performance levels back to normal. They do not want to be in the tool. If they never have to open this tool, these are all benefits. And, and helping data teams realize that they're not here to go look at the data or to under, they don't want to spend time in here for no reason. They want it, they have tasks to do and they want to get out of here. And I know most of you, you, you know all of this here, but again, thinking about this ignore verb within the PICA framework, sometimes AI is not the right tool to use. So just be cognizant of that when you're doing exploration. Um, Number five, uh, we, we definitely need to talk about interpretable and explainable uh, machine learning, uh, and particularly as it relates to accuracy. So there tends to be this um, trade-off uh, or perceived trade-off between high accuracy models, so models that have very strong predictive power versus ones that you can explain to somebody, how did it come up with that answer? And data people tend to like to focus on accuracy because accuracy is kind of a badge of pride to say we we have we've figured this out and we were able to fit this model such that it, it's 97 percent accurate when we run it against uh you know the the training set that we used you know we have we can prove that it has this really high predictability here um the problem with a lot of those is the technology used to build those very high accuracy models tends to be what we call those black box uh methods and black box methods and humans don't always go well together, particularly if, if humans are doing risky work or um, high intensity work. Like, you know, your, your Netflix recommender, do you need to see why it recommended these top five videos? No, you probably just make an eyeball decision that you don't care. But in other contexts where it's like, here are the five customers that we should stop doing business with. And here are the five prospects you should call that are most likely to become your next best customers over the next five years. If you, if you gave that information to a salesperson with no explanation about how did this system look at our entire customer base over 50 years, and it, it came up with that, and this your, your software, you data team, technology team, you have no idea what it's like to be a salesperson, and you want me to fire these customers and go focus my efforts converting these prospects who I've never talked to, they've never bought anything from us, and you want me to go do that, forget it. And it doesn't matter that you can prove that the training set, that, that the accuracy of the model is so great for, for important work like that. In this case, you know, sales is how the sales guy puts money on the table and bread, bread on the table at home for his family. He cares a lot about whether he's going to be successful with his quotas or his or her quotas, right? So explainability of the solutions can be very important in certain contexts, uh, especially with business software here. Um, and there's there's two facets here. I don't want to go too far into this, and it, it gets it, th these get a little bit abstract and, and confusing. But there's interpretable and explainable aren't the same thing. So interpretable, think of this as like opening the hood of your car and looking in, and you get to look at the model and see how is it working, what is going on under the cover. That is different than here's the result in a UI. How did you come up with that answer in a human readable, human uh, intelligible way? Which factors went into that prediction? 
that's your explainable uh, machine learning. That's probably more the domain that most designers would be dealing with. And one place designers can be really helpful is even understanding when we build this predictive model, let's say it's this for this, we're building a sales tool for salespeople to help them figure out where should I spend my time doing sales outreach and cold calling or whatever, look at all of our prospects and then generate some recommendations for me. Um, designers can help us help the data teams figure out where do we need explainability? Where's the trust going to be lost? What, what kinds of features are the sales team expecting the model to have? And in this case, I'm talking about the machine learning model features. So one of them may be uh, number of website visits, number of opens of, of demo content sent to them. These would be features. And, and if we know that the sales team has historically used some of those features heavily, we, you know, the designers may say, we really need to factor that information in here. And if we find out that that information actually has no bearing on it, that might be a, 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 a no bearing on the propensity of a buyer to buy. That can be a hard decision to have. And this is why I, I try to coach data teams that you need to design with your customers and not for them. I, I forget, I, I saw this on LinkedIn by another designer. That is not my idea, but I love that framing of the preposition with involve the sales team in the process of building this predictive tool so that they can understand this. And if they're part of it, it's going to be easier for them to let go of the fact that the number of website visits has nothing to do with whether or not they're going to buy. And they may need to let go of that truth that they felt was right. And it's tough to be wrong if that's your whole job, right? If, you, if your identity has been wrapped up with thinking that you know the metrics that lead people to buy in your organization, and salespeople tend to be looked up pretty highly, the good ones are kind of like rock stars in the business world. Finding out that you're wrong about that is a tough pill to swallow. And so again, we need to we need to have the users be part of the solutions that we're making here, especially where, where we're going to push up against expected norms that are maybe not actually true here. Um, let's jump into a, a like an, a kind of an example of this. So let's talk about sign language here. Like, and I want you to imagine like you're trying to learn um, sign language, right? So here's a student, you know, practicing on their laptop here, uh, trying to learn how to do the signs. And let's say their, their camera's on and there's an application here that I can, can actually look at your signs and then give you some feedback about whether you're making the signs correctly here. So you have this, com the CNN stands for, com uh, <laughs> it's a neural network, basically. It's not super important here, but th what's happening there is that the neural net is actually looking at all the video and parsing out what's going on. And there may be several different models under the cover there that are trying to, to, to understand and interpret the student practicing here. And of course, the training set, the data that went into this was based on the machine learning from a lot of samples of correct signs such that it can understand when a sign is correct or not. But what happens here, right, is this, if we think about student workflow, if they're using this tool to learn, they probably want to know when they're doing it right, and they want to know when they're doing it wrong. And the first thing they're going to ask is when they do it wrong is, well, what did I get wrong and what do I need to improve? So explainable AI is good, but one thing we need to also think about is that not everything needs to be to be explained. Um, so in this possible UI here, we might have a simple score, which is like, you got a two out of three when you tried to sign the word bread to me. You got a good job on hand shape. You got a good job on hand movement, but the location of where you held your hand was wrong. That sounds useful, right? But sometimes what data, data teams will present is, was the was the thing that you showed when you held your hand up, was it a hand or not? Well, of course, you're like, of course it was a hand. Do we need to tell the users it was a hand? Well, the reason the data team showed it is because the way the model works under the cover is the first thing it does is say, is it a human? Yes or no? Okay. Does that look like a, a hand or two hands? Yes or no? And, the, and that there's separate models that are doing each stage of this stuff before you get to shape movement and location features, where, which are actually the ones that the human in the loop would care about here. And this is a basic example, but I, I've seen, you know, tools before where it's like the number of features being shown to the users because the data team feels the need to expose a lot of the plumbing to the, the customer or the user. And it's overwhelming because of the, 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 the technology underneath is, is quite complex here. So we need to think about that idea of, of accuracy uh, um, and, and explainability. And we talked about this trade-off, right? Uh, the black box equivalent of this UI might be something that says you got 81% right. 
And so the data team may be thinking, well, this is great because we're 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 ninety eight percent sure that, or in this case, we're eighty one percent sure that you signed this thing correctly, and we're nineteen percent sure that it might not be correct here. And as you can imagine, as a user, they're probably thinking, well, what what does that mean to me? Like, what did I get wrong here that I'm eighty percent correct here? And under the covers, the, the the data scientists may think that this is a better solution because the machine's ability to know whether or not the sign was correct is the the predictive power is much higher if we use you know, method A versus explainable method B, which looks nice and it gives you that nice UI that we showed here, but it's not right all the time. Sometimes it gets it wrong. It gives you a, a, a false positive uh, or a false negative. So it says you're wrong when you're correct or it says you're correct when you're actually doing it wrong. And, and a lot of times data teams can be so afraid of giving wrong information out that they, again, they relentlessly focus on the predictive power of the model. Again, this is all human factor stuff that I think designers can be very good at providing, like what level of transparency and explainability do we need to give? What is the risk if we get the information wrong? Like if the model is wrong, is it a big deal? Um, is there some recourse? Is there a way for the user to play with the interface to, to, to learn about how the prediction is being made or not? These are questions that a lot of, in my opinion, the data teams don't tend to ask these questions, but designers do. And this all affects what's going to happen under the covers here. Um, this whole explainability uh, and model interpretability space is like a whole subset of, of, of data science. If you're interested in this, there's two names I interviewed, uh, Cynthia Rudin, R-U-D-I-N. Uh, she is a, um, she's an academic, but she was the Squirrel AI winner, I think two years ago, which is like a million dollar prize for research in AI. Very much focus on actually explainability and specifically making the argument that it's kind of an excuse now that you need these giant data sets and you have to use black box methods to have high predictive accuracy. Her argument is that that's not, that's not true. Explainability matters in most cases, uh, and, and it's possible to do that with smaller data sets and not using black box uh, models to do it. That's kind of her space. Uh, Vera Leon, uh, V-E-R-A, last name L-I-A-O. I I'm, uh, actually just was texting with her about getting her onto the uh, podcast. She's a Microsoft researcher, very much looking at HCI uh, and explainable AI, which you might see written as XAI. So those, those are two names just kind of in my head at the moment, if you're interested in that space. I, I think it's a very interesting space for, for designers because it really gets into the interface uh, layer. Um, number six here, um, data problems are become AI problems. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Schenectady data problem. Does anybody know what I'm going to be talking about here? Just a quick poll. I know there's a little lag, so I'll just give it a second for any chats to pop in. Well, here's the Schenectady problem. Schenectady is obviously a city in New York. And the zip code is 12345, the same combination on my matched luggage if you've seen Spaceballs. And so... The, the, the joke here is like, where are all of our customers are? Where, where are all the prospects joining our mailing list from? They're from Schenectady. Like, wow, we have so many people interested in Schenectady. Why? Well, the marketing team said that you have to fill out first name, last name, email address, and zip code. And people are like, F you, I'm not giving you my zip code. One, two, three, four, five, just like Trey's uh, combination on his match luggage. And so it looks like Schenectady has all this information. And so the point here that I'm making here is that clean data is a giant problem for organizations right now that are trying to leverage AI. Uh, and, and so thinking about how does the data get into the system, particularly if it comes from software, again, designers, our, our ability to think big picture and think about the, the entire workflows here, like how do we get to this spot here? What are all the, the service touch points and all the humans in the loop that are involved? These are things I think we can help out with. And we may find that like, we're never going to fix this problem until, until we get the ingest problem correct, which means the Salesforce UI where the salespeople are typing comments in about their leads, we need to better structure that interface there so that the data is broken up in a way that your model, which is going to live downstream over here and do this future cool new stuff down the road, it's only going to be able to do that if we fix what's going on upstream with this other user experience here. Uh, and so I, I don't want to dwell 
too much on this except to say this can be this is a giant problem for the data teams and there are human factors uh, touch points uh, that goes into this this is also where bias uh, gets in here whether it's creating bias for example like if you have people labeling and training the data and they and they may not be intentionally introducing bias but because of the way the interface they're using uh, works in order to train a data set for later AI use if it's not designed uh, uh, appropriately, they can be introducing bias. And then we, of course, we have the situation with all the historical data from legacy enterprises, like think about the banking sector, right? Like if you, the, the, the long and short of is any bank you go to, it's going to say, don't give money to black people. Just don't. Why? Well, the, of course, I, I think most people on this call, you probably know the history that goes into to lending and all this kind of stuff, but the model's not going to come up with a new insight and be ethical out of the box because all it is is statistical it's just a statistical guessing machine that looks at past data and comes up with future stuff it's not going to auto correct for those kinds of things so the question is what intentional design will we bring in there to address those kinds of issues and again this gets into the human factors piece the ethics piece uh and, and places where i think designers are are really ripe to, to help out um if you want to see a great collection of where these things go wrong where, where ai systems go wrong uh, i interviewed sean mcgregor who runs a project called the ai incident database it's basically a collection of news stories broken down by topics industries companies and they're tracking major incidents with AI there. It's uh, episode 70 was the one I interviewed him on on both the incident database and also his work in uh, predicting uh, and dealing with uh, fire uh, fire maintenance uh, for forest fires uh, forest fires using machine learning. It's a really he's a very fascinating uh, guy. Uh, definitely worth uh, checking that out. The AI incident database. You can just Google that. Um, <clears throat> number seven here is uh, this kind of human centered and system thinking approach here. We've kind of talked about this already a, a little bit broadly speaking, but um, this is that thinking holistically from, again, that point of like ingest, where does the data come from that's going to be used for the models that we're going to build that later will get deployed into an application that will become this feature that then enables this value downstream. That ability to think big picture like that uh, and to think about all the humans in the loop and to get out of the requirements kind of mindset I think we really need to have designers and UX professionals in that space sticking their nose in there to say, we can help with this to make sure that your model gets used, that it actually creates some value and, and, and does some good for our business and for our customers and, and all of that. So I, 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 I have some other comments on that. I know we're getting uh, close to time here and I want to have some time for questions here. So I'm going to skip over this uh, a, a, a little bit. Uh, and the last one I wanted to talk about here is that nobody really wants analytics or machine learning or any of that, particularly in the AI, in the enterprise context, people want outcomes from the outputs that we create. And, and I'm sure many of you have heard about this outcomes versus out output mentality. I still see relentless focus on this, whether it's from designers or uh, from data professionals, that they're so focused on the thing, the noun that they're, they're, they're making, the thing that's going to get spit out of the factory, the, the code factory at the end, and not not having accountability for the downstream value and outcome that that thing is supposed to create. And even when the business says, we need we need a large language model, we what are we doing with chat GPT? The business doesn't want, even the executive team, they don't really want an AI strategy. They don't want a large language model. They want some kind of benefit that comes from that, whether it's increased sales or reducing cost or uh, empowering people to make better decisions or whatever it may be, someone needs to unpack that. And I think if designers are in charge of loving the problem al along with product management, and I see those circles as very uh, overlapping in, in, in my, especially in the enterprise kind of space, um, we, we can bring that kind of um, picture and, and perspective uh, to these projects and keep reminding the team that it's not about the thing that we're making, it's about the downstream value of the thing here. The designer's job is not to just come in and visualize the data or slap an interface on to some kind of predictive model that will eventually get spit out into some tool or some dashboard that needs some nice charts and colors on it. Yes, the charts, the colors, the, the data, that stuff does matter, 
but it certainly doesn't matter if we have no idea what the context of use is, how people make decisions, and what the downstream value is the outcome that we're going for. It doesn't matter if you properly visualize the data because no one's going to use it anyways. So I want you guys to be just just keep that in mind that it's no one really wants this stuff, right? If anything, some people are afraid of it, just like with the chat GPT, people are already afraid it's going to replace their jobs and all this kind of stuff. That's not what people want from it. Um, so we have to we have to think beyond the, the the things what comes out of the exhaust. So this just kind of recapturing the, these eight ideas: skate where the puck is going, the CED framework, thinking about conclusions first, um, thinking about all the all the different human parties and personas that are involved besides users and business stakeholders. Right? Uh, PICA, the acronym: Predict, Ignore, Classify, uh, Augment, Automate. If you're trying to find machine learning use cases for your product and kind of retroactively look for places where you can start to use some of these advanced technologies here, um, interpretable and explainable may trump accuracy, right? Making sure that people can understand how did it come up with that prediction, that guess, where did that come from? Can I tweak it? That may be more important than high uh, predictive power. Uh, data problems become AI problems. This is the space of bias, abuse, bad predictions. We need to think about false positives, false negatives. All, all that kind of stuff is part of, to me, designing an experience around these solutions. We talked about system thinkings and human-centered approach. And, and then finally, remembering nobody really wants analytics or machine learning in the first place. They want the promise that sits downstream from those things that we're making. So uh, if you guys want some a little bit more on this and you haven't gotten bored enough of me talking to you yet, uh, these are a few episodes I thought designers in particular may be interested in if you want to just take a screenshot of this or whatever. Uh, a bunch of just interesting people here, from uh, some from engineering backgrounds. Ben Schneiderman uh, just wrote a book on human-centered uh, AI work. Uh, Carol Smith, I'm sure some of you know uh, her her work in uh, both uh, military uh, context with um, with AI is, is, is fascinating there. Um, I'm not going to read all those to you because you guys you can read them. But if you're really looking for people with a, a design or a product uh, kind of slant or UX slant, those are some of the guests that I've I've had on the show uh, in that space. Uh, and then the last two, a couple of things here. I'm actually launching a data product leadership community. Um, I've got some designers in there. We just have the 20 founding members were selected last week, uh, and this is really a space to try to bring together um, designers. Uh, both product managers, but also aspiring internal data product managers, which is kind of a new role here, along with our data science colleagues and, and get conversation going about uh, these kinds of things there. Um, more stuff on just my, if you're interested in this whole space of designing indispensable data products, I have a an insights mailing list I've published for seven years. Uh, every Tuesday, uh, I send out some kind of missive or insight there. Uh, I also put one page summaries of the podcast if you don't have a lot of time to listen, but you want to kind of keep up uh, there. Uh, and then uh, a few even more, these are even more recent episodes. Um, I didn't have time to, to consolidate those two slides uh, there, but if you're, uh, if you're interested, these are particularly on data product uh, management. If you're in the other category from the product side, you might really uh, enjoy some of those episodes. That's about it. I've got about seven minutes for questions. Uh, those are those links there if you're interested in my email address if you want to get in touch. I am not heavily on Twitter, um, but Rhythm Spice is my uh, handle. If you want to message me there, you can. And I, it's been great to talk to you all. I don't know if there's any uh, questions I can answer. <clears throat> Uh, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, and we do have a couple questions, so we're going to go ahead and ask. And I did want to share uh, my screen because we did prepare a little bit of something. Um, could you stop sharing for a second? Oh, yes. So I that I can. Go ahead. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> Okay, here we are. We did prepare a QR code so people can easily uh, join your mailing list as well and your Twitter handle. Um, so with that, I'm just going to go ahead and ask a couple questions that pop up first. So with big, or big organizations releasing their own AIs and encouraging other organizations to also build their internal chat GPTs, what are the pros and cons that you see with this approach? Can you, I've, I didn't get all of that. Can you restate that again? Sure. So there are many organizations, um, and I'm looking at you, IBM, uh, who are building their own AIs internally and encouraging their clients and other companies to also 
build their internal uh, quote unquote chat GPTs that will be knowledgeable of all, 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 all the internal information mm -hmm. uh, of the company, right? And what are some of the pros and cons that you see with this approach? I think there's probably more pros than cons with that information. If you think about, I mean, even like Zoom being able to summarize what this entire conference day was about into a brief amount of information. I think there's a lot of pros that go, go into that. Um, I, I think the the there's obviously hype uh, in the large language model space right now. And there's, you know, we, we have the compute power to to finally do some of these kinds of things here. And there's a lot of uh, great application of that. I guess the some of the risks that I would see here is the it's not a binary de delivering like a, a chat GPT equivalent for your business is not a binary thing where it's like, if you think about a traditional software application, we can QA. It's like, does it does it work or not? Like I, you put your data into this form and then it's supposed to generate this new record and then you get to view the record or whatever. And you can kind of say, did it work or not? The challenge here with these models is that how do you validate that the information coming back is actually correct? Because these, these, these are guessing machines um, and, and there's actually some really interesting stuff just as a tangent here. I don't, there is a, uh, the, the MIT's podcast called, um, on AI, it's called, um, MIT technology review, uh, in machines we trust. Uh, and you, you, the scientist that left Google recently talking about how he's actually thinking that he's seen, there's evidence of reasoning. If you, depending on how you define reasoning by these large language models here, which is this first sign of like some intelligence here and, I know this might sound very um, sci-fi to some people here, but if it, I, I've actually had a conversation with a few data scientists about whether or not they agree with that argument that there's signs of reasoning happen, happening here, but whether or not that's happening or not, that the, the, these are subjective kind, there's some subjectivity that goes along with all of this. And being able to decipher facts from fiction when the model is generating, uh, you know, here's a report of what happened in the meeting. How are you sure that that's actually what that person said? And and let's say this person's not there anymore, and we're assuming that the the information coming out of the models is correct. I think understanding how would we test for how what would be the 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 user testing that we would do. Imagine usability testing for a second. It might not be so much usability, but the utility, the believability, the, the, the transparency of the model. This is a great place where it's like understanding, if you think about that CED framework, what were the ingredients that went into the, the, the summary of this meeting that happened? And maybe that's a bad idea because it's you know summarizing a Zoom call. The source data is one Zoom call conversation here. But if you asked it like, what has been the trend and what, what has the product management team been spending its time on for the last six months? What are, what are, and because we have 1700 product managers that are at IBM, are there common themes we should be aware of? And what, what are the, what are the biggest challenges our product organization is having right now? How do we validate that that information is actually going to be correct? Um, I, I think, and, and how do we know that the, the model is going to give us the kinds of uh, usable and useful enough answers as well? Uh, because because there may not be a um, uh, we don't want to create a platform that theoretically can answer any question, but it doesn't answer any one question particularly well. I think again, this is where designers can be really helpful here to set some kind of benchmarks about what is a quality response from an LLM. How would we measure that it passed the qualitative test, the quality test from a human factors perspective? How would we know that kind of stuff? And being part of the teams to do this, I think I think that's a, another right place for designers to be involved here. Um, I should say, I, I, these are just my opinions. I'm not an expert in the large uh, text analytics and the large language model space. There, there are probably definitely other UX people that are much more deep in the, in the chat uh, space than I am. So just I, I just want to put that out there as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. And just before yeah. we go on the next breakout rooms, uh, there is another question. What tools can we use for implementing that PICA framework for the typical UX researcher in a way that it is safe for the organization they work for? What are the tools? I, this isn't, I don't know if you mean like software tools or something like that. It's not necessarily a tool. It's just a 
it's just a thinking framework, right? Just like design thinking, for example, it's it's just a, an idea I came up with to generate ways to brainstorm around developing AI use cases there. Obviously, is it safer, all of that? This gets into ethics and all that kind of stuff. There are, there are concepts out there like red teaming or abusability testing. This is the idea of like when we build a model, how could we take advantage of this to really screw with somebody? How could we invade someone's privacy? How could we hurt somebody with it? And and there are and this I, I don't know if you guys have had discussions about this uh, maybe, but this I I don't think it's Carol Smith's term of usability testing. I think someone else came up with it. That's where I first heard about it. But this is this kind of fun idea of like putting your red team hat on and go in there and try to do bad. But even just spending the time for a team and not just the designers, I think it's really important to have data scientists in the room too, because they know intimately what kind of information went into the models here. But to think about it from that opposite perspective and having diverse teams as well at the table, right, including possibly some downstream stakeholders, right? Uh, think about, again, the, the your facial recognition camera and you've got your airport passengers that are not thinking about the security systems at that level of detail. They don't really know what's going on behind that camera. But maybe there's a point for a designer to bring in some passengers there to understand what's going on here to, to, help, um, to help them understand how would you feel if you knew that this is what the software was doing? Like, would you feel like you're, you're being protected and your safety is paramount? Or would you feel like this is major big brother kind of stuff here? How would we know we might need to get some people that are not like us, that are not the people making the tools, but some direct input from people outside of that? So that Pika framework is not really about any particular tool or anything like that. I just want to give a seed seeds for creativity to, to happen around that. And the, the, those verbs come from um, very, uh, very particular uh, instantiations of machine learning, prediction, automation, classification. These all kind of tie back to technical models that data scientists use to build machine learning models. So that's partly why I picked those. But I think they're simple enough verbs that we can brainstorm uh, around those. So I hope that was helpful. I, I'm sorry, I don't have any particular tools or anything. But <clears throat> Excellent. That was an excellent answer.